Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. My guest today is Peter Jenkins, and he's going to be talking all about his new venture, his new business called Simple Foundry. And Peter's going to run through how you can leverage Microsoft and the suite of products that you have available within Microsoft to digitally transform your safety management system. It's a great presentation that Peter gives, uh, lots of good questions coming out as a result. And if you're listening to this on the podcast as opposed to watching the video on YouTube, go to the show notes and you can find not only Peter's slides but also a link to the video version as well. Uh, he does do a great job of talking it through without referring to the slides too much, uh, but you might find there are parts that you want to refer to a bit more information. I learnt a lot from this discussion. Um, it changed the way uh, that I think about digitization and actually thinking about the tools that are within our grasp already and not necessarily needing to look uh, so far outside. Uh, so I'm sure you'll get something from this whatever size organization you're in and however far you already are along the journey of safety digitization. Enjoy it. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Safety Roundtable session uh, with me, Christian Harris, and my very special guest, Peter Jenkins, today. We've got a fantastic topic that uh, Peter is going to be talking through with us. Uh, and then, um, as always, we will open it up to questions. Uh, if you're on Zoom and you want to ask a question, uh, you can type it into the chat and I'll do my best to monitor that. Or um, at the end, feel free to uh, go to reactions, raise your hand, and you can unmute and come and chat to us. If you're watching this anywhere else, uh, come and join us on the Zoom. If you like, there should be a link that you can come and find uh, the Zoom link and join us. But if not, then um, again, I will try my best to monitor the chat. But if you are desperate to ask Peter a question, then uh, I'd recommend coming onto the Zoom because um, you can be waving and shouting and we'll definitely see you there. Um, cool. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about digitization of safety today. So do you want to start, Peter, by, well, firstly, give a quick background and introduce yourself and then maybe talk a little bit about the kind of key benefits of digitizing safety yeah perfect so uh, good afternoon everyone great to be here today so my name is peter jenkins as you've probably gathered by now uh, i've been in safety for quite a few years they say that when you get into safety if you've been in for a while you should say you've been in for over a decade because it sounds better so i've been in for over a decade but don't ask me by how much over a decade um, through that time, I've worked in a whole bunch of different areas in safety. So I started my career in hospitality down in London at Hilton Hotels, doing kind of a bit of everything, really leaning into my background uh, in environmental health. Moved out of hospitality into food manufacturing as she advisor. And it's almost kind of like that experience of driving where you do all your qualifications, do all this and that, and you're effectively learning to pass the driving test. Then you get out on the road and you learn to drive. And fundamentally getting in kind of my first proper full-time safety job in food manufacturing very much felt like learning to drive. Thrown in a bit at the deep end with a lot of technical and transformational challenges in a relatively small food manufacturing site with about 120 staff. In that particular site, I kind of grew as she advisor into she manager. And it was really then that I started to get involved with using Microsoft. So that was about maybe kind of 2017, 2018. <clears throat> And from that kind of first learning to drive moment, I thought, right, well, I can go a little bit quicker. I can be a bit of a boy racer with this and I can make life a bit easier for everyone at the same time. But being from Yorkshire and working in a Yorkshire pudding factory, I thought, right, OK, I need to fit into the trope of being a tight Yorkshireman. So I thought, right, I need to do it for free. I need to kind of do it with that remit of not having a budget. So turning to Microsoft as something that we already had access to was a bit of a no brainer. 
really at that point it was a case of learning by doing a bit of trial and error going out on forums reading uh, articles that had been published on blogs watching youtube videos and collectively over a few years working in that food manufacturing site i started to hone my skills won a few awards kind of nationally for a few different bits and pieces a few different organizations including the british frozen food federation and i can see simon's just joined us there who was on the on the panel for that back in the day as well so finished uh, in that kind of site as she manager looking after 120 staff and progressed into group health and safety manager for a food manufacturer and chilled ambient and frozen distributor of foodstuffs across the UK. That was 18 sites, three business units and about 750 staff. Suddenly, the idea of using a free thing from Microsoft had to grow a little bit. I had to scale it from that point of view. What worked for one site wouldn't necessarily work for 18, but I had to try. It was the same again. You've got kind of a team of one, but a team of 700. And we have to make it work. We have to try and understand how we can use what we have access to already because there is no budget. There's no defined kind of set amount of money for us to be able to work through it. And again, hone my skills nicely through that, really scaling what could be done with Microsoft, introducing new management system techniques to people that didn't have, with the best will in the world, a great level of digital literacy which naturally was one of the big barriers to achieving a digital safety management system. And I'll be going over how I managed to deal with that a little later on as well. And then finish that kind of time as group health and safety manager after implementing a new safety management system through Microsoft over about two years and joined Stagecoach as head of safety. Now that again, that's a completely different scale. You've got 20 odd thousand staff, 120 locations and about 18 different businesses. So trying to understand the scalability of how you can apply digital safety management systems to a business like that, going from previously three years prior, a single site of 120 people is quite the curve. And it's really the frameworks that I use to try and manage and improve and enhance and plan for safety management systems across she advisor to she manager to group health and safety manager to head of safety that I'll be taking everyone through today. So very excited to get started, Christian, and I hope that gives kind of a bit of a background uh, to myself as well for everyone. Yeah, that's great context. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, and um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions because I guess there are going to be people on here that are all, at all those different kinds of uh, of stages, which is uh, which is interesting and, and useful. Um, what's your sense of how far most or the average organisation is in terms of this digital? revolution or digital journey where 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 do you sort of feel like most people are it, it's, it's a great question i think there's a lot of excitement but i think there's also a bit of trepidation and nervousness and that's nervousness in the sense that if people aren't starting now they're going to miss out on it but it's also nervousness to think right okay there's a lot going on in other functions so food safety hr supply chain management if i think about industry 4.0 from an engineering perspective as well there's a huge level of acceleration of digital solutions being adopted across loads of different functions. But health and safety traditionally hasn't been the most agile. With the best will in the world to us and with all respect to us, we're not always the quickest when it comes down to adopting new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, yeah, I think there's a lot of excitement. I think there's a lot of people that don't really know where to start, but people are keen. As a profession, we're keen because we know we can see it. We can see the world changing around us. And we know that we're going to have to adopt it sooner or later. But the question is, where do we start? What do we need to do about it? Good stuff. And um, you uh, are going to be talking today, and you mentioned already about using the kind of Microsoft suite of, of products. Um, was that driven by going out into the marketplace and sort of seeing what was there and being um, unimpressed or unsatisfied or whatever the right word is, either from a sort of functionality perspective or a quality perspective or perhaps a cost perspective what what what, what were the sort of headline drivers for going down the microsoft route gotcha without wanting to fit into tropes it, it's because i was really tight christian to be honest with you um a lot of the budget that i had access to wasn't earmarked for digital safety management systems or kind of digital software um it's not something that i really had a lot of experience with when I was first starting out, you know, you, there was no Nibosh course on how to set a budget. There's no Irish course on how to effectively manage a budget for this type of stuff. So you kind of just have to throw yourself in and go for it. Now, at that point, I reached out to a lot of people around me to try and understand, OK, well, what should I be looking for in a digital management system and actually looking for in software? And over the last sort of five years or so, I've built up quite a nice question list for what 
people actually could look out for when they're trying to look at third party software solutions. Um, and I hope you don't mind, Christian, but as a little bit of freebies to everyone in this in this uh, Zoom call, I've got a feedback survey at the end. And if people can fill in that feedback survey, you'll get a copy of the question list that I use for what you should be looking out for in health and safety software from a third party supplier point of view. Um, so it's a little bit of a freebie, and that's probably going to do a bit more uh, of justice of answering the question than I could possibly do in a couple of minutes. Yeah, no, perfect. We can definitely get definitely get that uh, get that out to everybody, so we can share that around um, to uh, the email list, and, and when we get the replay up, and when we put it out on the podcast, and all of that good stuff as well. So hopefully, people can help Peter and fill that in and uh, get something in return as well, which is a, which is always yeah, a good really good stuff. deal. Yeah. So um, over to you then. Why don't you share screens and start yeah, kind perfect. of showing us what you wanted to uh, to go through today? Okie doke. Right. Let's get this one shared. And I'll I'll monitor the I'll monitor any questions coming in and intervene if there's anything pressing. Yeah, smash it. No, that's very much appreciated. Uh, I've literally just brought this up, but I can can everyone see that? Okay, to start yep. with, Christian. Should, yeah, perfect. should be all there. Right. Yep. Uh, you're not getting the green bar of zoom at the top are you at the same time no no perfect all right then smashing uh so without further ado i'll kind of dive into it then there's quite a few slides to go through but i'm really keen to give people the opportunity to kind of share what they want to talk about and kind of put a few things in the chat um so if you just bear with me a second so i can quickly bring that up at the same time just in case anything immediately comes through right okie doke perfect Perfect, perfect, perfect. Right. OK, then. So um, in terms of a little bit about me to kind of start with then. So who are Simple Foundry? Um, so Simple Foundry is a consultancy that was really established by myself last year. I'll be perfectly honest with you, as I kind of got to a position in head of safety, I really had an opportunity to reflect on the type of person that I was becoming uh, in that position and really found that actually there was slightly a different direction that I wanted to take my career and take my life in. And rather than kind of delivering on things that I knew that I could do, I thought, right, life feels a little bit short relative to some of the experiences that I've had. I'd, I'd quite like to do something a little bit different. And so I thought, right, I'm going to enter the world of standard health and safety consultancy, but I want to start my own business on the side. I know that I can deliver really good digital safety solutions using Microsoft. I've done it for years. I've won awards for years about it. I know that this will work and I know that I can help people that are in a similar or were in a similar position to me, maybe one or two years before where I am now. And the drive to help them has really formed the basis of who we are in Simple Foundry and what we do and why we do it. So like I said, and as you can probably gather, we simplify workloads, digitize systems and automate processes. Fundamentally, that's it. It's about making life easier, making it better without breaking the bank. And to do that, we really leverage Microsoft. So if we take a focus on your paper or digital systems, ultimately, whatever your focus is, we can digitize them into either a dedicated form, trigger or process and fundamentally automate your administration. Like I said before, there's many people in here that I'm sure are a team of one, but a team of X hundred at the same time. And if you can imagine the benefits that you can get from having effectively a digital admin available 24 seven to work for you, the benefits really start to stack up very quickly. So fundamentally, if you've got a challenge regarding your processes, paper based or digital, you want to make them smarter or better. That's exactly where Simple Foundry can come in. Without kind of going into a huge amount of detail, it's not necessarily just for health and safety professionals, but if you are, for example, a functional director, a business owner, or a consultant, be that in health and safety or somewhere else and as well, Simple Foundry is here for you. We want to basically teach you and engage you in how you can use Microsoft to add value to your clients, to your customers, and ultimately to the front line of staff who are going to be living your safety management systems every single day. So on that basis, then, what do we want to consider when we're starting the digital health and safety management system journey? Well, I'm going to thematically break it down a little bit. First things first, we need to focus on people. Like, without a shadow of a doubt, we can't have effective safety management systems that don't champion people first. You can have all the best paperwork in the world. You can have the best processes in the world. But if people aren't engaging with them, the audience doesn't use it. The doers aren't engaging with it regularly and the validators aren't actually checking that it's effective. 
it's not going to be worth anything is that a safety management system and one of the ways that you can kind of get a start on how to understand people is baselining digital literacy so very quickly, what, what do we mean by digital literacy? It is basically how good are your staff, at your people at using technology? Over the years, I've worked in businesses where people literally don't have a mobile phone, which in this day and age seems absolutely crazy. I've got two literally right next to me, which is just mad then to think that people don't actually use a mobile phone. But if they don't, how can they be expected to use a digital safety management system effectively? So at the very least, identifying and segmenting your audience, your doers and your validators and baselining their digital literacy. So you've got a rough understanding as to how effective they can be when it comes down to implementing your digital management system is a great place to start. The second thing to consider is patterns and pattern based learning. Now, as, as human beings, just generally speaking, we thrive off storytelling. Fundamentally, that's one of the earliest ways that we passed information from one, one another to each other. That, that was simply it. We told stories. When it comes down to health and safety, we can actually design a health and safety management system kind of around storytelling to start with if we think about pattern based learning. So I'm sure that there's quite a few of you on this call now that will have a mobile phone. Fundamentally, there's quite a few of you that will have a, a social media app or you'll have a messaging app like WhatsApp, for example. So if I think about how we can do risk assessments, but using a pattern to help us with the health and safety management systems, we might say, right, okay, if you use WhatsApp to take a voice note, for example, and send that voice note to a friend, in theory, you can actually take a picture of your environment and use a voice note to record what the risks are as part of that. Talk through the risks like you would do a risk assessment. And then literally just forward that uh, particular voice note to either uh, someone that's a manager or a supervisor or take that voice note and save it to a digital repository. Give it a title for the risk assessment. And there you go. It's a very, very quick, rough, easy way of doing a dynamic risk assessment that you can actually then use a standard pattern of learning to deliver. So when we're thinking about patterns, think about the detail in terms of how we might actually implement certain arrangement requirements, but also at the bigger picture, how we can start to structure our safety management systems. I've worked in food for years, years, and I absolutely love working in food and drink. It's an amazing sector to get into. Um, I I'm going to point to Simon Brentnell for a second as well on here, just because he's up on, on the front as well. But reach out to Simon from the British Frozen Food Federation. Uh, he's a fantastic contact to have, and we'll be really good at talking about more safety bits in food and drink, especially in the frozen food bits right now. But fundamentally, if you've got a food manufacturer that you're working with, they'll already have a really strong food safety management system. They'll have a lot to do with HACCP in there. They might even in the UK be using everything linked to the British Retail Consortium, which actually has a lot of structure applied to it that you can transfer to health and safety. So, for example, when I was joining a business that didn't have a very strong health and safety function, but had a ridiculously strong food safety function, I didn't go in and talk about health and safety. I talked about risk, I talked about critical control points, and I talked about how they manage food safety from an end-to-end -end point of view, from where they get suppliers coming in and they start to look at the quality of kind of base ingredients and raw materials through to it reaching the end customer when it's actually on their plate. And thinking about the same thing, how do we take, for example, a big block of cheese that's 30 kilograms coming in and saying, actually, from a raw material point of view, there's a big manual handling risk there. So we can actually reduce our risk through looking at procurement risk management and saying, let's take two 15 kilogram boxes rather than 30. Yes, there's a cost that's associated with that, but we start to think in patterns. We start to think about how we can apply health and safety into other areas in our businesses. One thing that I've got there at the bottom is canvassing perceptions, cognitions and willingness to act. Now, uh, I don't know if many of you have kind of seen this before or kind of engaged with it online, uh, but Netflix has got an amazing culture statement. When it comes down to thinking about how people will engage with different management systems and engage with work, their culture kind of system is really strong. It underpins a lot of different engagement techniques. And they have used a particular book called The Culture Map by Erin Myers or M. M-E-Y-E-R-S, uh, sorry, it don't nest uh, at the end, just Erin Meyer uh, for the culture map. And it's a phenomenal book to read. 
and definitely one that's worthwhile because it can really help understand what to ask when it comes down to canvassing for these perceptions, cognitions and actions. Now, the other two things to consider are performance and scope versus scope creep. So fundamentally, when we're looking at our safety management system and we're kind of starting it out, we need to understand what's driving our demands. Is it coming internally from our frontline staff? Is it coming from our senior executive team or is it a demand from our customers? For example, if you've got customers that are saying, we're not going to deal with you unless you've got 45,001, chances are is that you're going to need 45,001. But realistically, if you have the flexibility to choose and to set your own pace and your own performance expectations, make sure that you're doing that against the context of these internal and external needs. But also consider it in the context of your technical and transformational performance. So when we think about technical, we're talking about like an A to Z list of topics in health and safety, from accidents all the way down to workplace welfare and zootopic risks, for example, that might be in, in your particular business. And we want to think about how we can start to engage with both together at the same time. Because ultimately, it's like I've said there, if you want to transform slips and trips in your business, but you're not doing a baseline measurement of how slippery the floor is in the first place, is it going to be as effective as possible? So on that basis, why would you look at transforming safety culture in your business if we aren't benchmarking our technical performance at the same time? The two will go hand in hand as part of that. And that can lend itself well to that scope versus scope creep. So I've seen businesses, for example, that proudly say that they've got 45,001, right? Then you ask for the scope of it and the scope says, well, it's actually for the desk based site uh, in our office that's 300 miles away from where we're working. But we've got 45,001. You kind of think, is that really doing justice to what you want that safety management system to deliver? Is the scope of that really reflective of what you want to achieve as part of your ambitions and your aims, both personally, professionally, but also as a function and an executive team as well? So getting all of these kind of things defined, first of all, will set you up for success. Now, when it came down to me, what did I actually use? What were my actual implementation techniques? So like I kind of alluded to at the start, as you kind of move from she advisor through to she manager, through to group health and safety manager, through to kind of like a head of safety across the UK, scalability fundamentally comes to the forefront of everything that you'll need to consider from a health and safety management system point of view. And we can't necessarily scale effectively if we're not thinking in frameworks. Uh, for those of you who work in more of a corporate environment, I'm sure that you've come across the term freedom within a framework before. I'm sure that there's a t-shirt with it on somewhere. I really am. But, but what can it actually mean? What does the frameworks that people refer to there actually look like? Uh, well, the one that I kind of start with is one called organizational architecture. Now, I'm not expecting everyone here to nod heads because I've not kind of got the, got the video of everyone up. But if you've heard of organizational architecture, please do feel free to pop a comment in if you have as well into the chat. It'd be great to see. Um, for those of you who haven't, there's a really good book that will explain this, and it's called The First 90 Days. Now, this was actually shared with me by a senior leader in the food manufacturing sector, a guy called John Boyle, who I've got a huge amount of respect for, recommended uh, I read this book as I moved into a group health and safety management role. And he was absolutely right to. The First 90 Days is terrific. Slightly it has an American bias attached to it. But it's a really good book for explaining a few key frameworks that you can use in business and apply it to health and safety. So what I kind of did with organizational architecture is take that framework and simply put it down. What am I trying to achieve with my safety management system? I'm trying to define my uh, strategic direction. I'm trying to work out my structure. What am I actually doing to coordinate the work that I've said we're going to do in the strategy? What the skills base is, that's where digital literacy really comes into it. If I've got a safety management system that necessitates people using mobile phones, using tablets, using, I don't know, fixed bits of interactive touch points across the site, but none of them have got a strong level of digital literacy, I'm never going to get to a really strong engagement level with my safety management system. So even understanding skills bases, as much as we're looking at kind of core behavioral and technical skills, we want to consider how are people working, just generally speaking, what's their digital literacy like? And then finally, that's where we come into our core processes, which is really saying, what are the processes that we're using? Now, for me, that's where Microsoft really comes into it, really, really comes into it, because we can start to implement more digital processes 
that we can align to our skills bases of digital literacy that we can put against the structure of our management system folder system and we can start to deliver on our strategic direction and how we actually do things from a strategy point of view as i say the first 90 days really strong book i can see adam's put a comment in there that says the first 90 days changed the way i work and i'll be honest with you adam i'm in the complete same boat it's a phenomenal phenomenal bit of uh, reading is that really really good Another framework to consider might actually be thinking, OK, we've got a safety management system that we want to deliver. We know that there's going to be a big A to Z list of stuff that we want to do. But actually, conceptually, what framework do we want to use to underpin this? So a lot of you will have come across new view safety versus old school safety. You'll have come across HOP. You'll have come across all the new fangled types of health and safety. So in my other kind of day job from a consultancy point of view, I work in a business called Risk Fluent. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Risk Fluent, but we've recently published the framework for operational success. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail with it here, but feel free to drop a message if you'd like me to send you some information on it. But the framework for operational success focuses on reliability, organizational learning, human performance and culture. So if we think about, right, we know that we need to have a safety management system. But where's the concept? Where's the concept of safety going to go in this business for the next few years? Taking a really big overarching view, especially kind of as group health and safety manager or head of safety, will give you the ability to set more effective direction, depending on what you want to achieve in your business relative to its maturity. So, for example, a business that's never had a safety management system before or never had even a safety function before might be perfect for introducing a new framework because they've not had any preconceptions as to what could be there. But a business that has done the way that we've done for the last 10 years, and we, we, we do what we, we know what we know and we like what we know and we do what we know, might be a little bit more challenging to introduce a complete new framework in. So health and safety management systems, think about the concept, think about your frameworks, think about how you're going to apply it. Okay, so on applying it then, how do we actually do it? So another kind of framework that I've used for this is called objective, strategy, tactics, task. So if I think about, OK, I've got an objective within, let's say that it's in the framework here and I'm looking at uh, choice architecture to influence behavior to better improve human performance. I might say that one of my objectives in choice architecture is that sites always use a digital accident process when an employer liability accident occurs on the site. All right, cool. It's a fairly smart objective. It doesn't quite have a time frame to it here, but it's pretty understandable. What's the strategy? Simplification and standardization. What are the tactics? Well, in terms of standardization, we want organize, organizational architecture implemented along with the governance structure, and we want to have digitalization of processes and an improvement in digital literacy. At that point, I can go underneath that and then start to produce the tasks that will deliver on the tactics, that will deliver on the strategy, that will then ultimately achieve the objective. So when you're thinking about how can I structure the objectives associated with my health and safety management system, build it up on itself, but don't make life too hard for yourselves. Think about it simply. Objectives, strategies, tactics, tasks. Just break it down. And it can actually start to make transparency a lot easier for senior leaders, for your peers, and also for your direct managers as well. If you're able to quickly turn around and say, actually, we're 50% of the way to our tactics underneath this strategy of standardization, because you know that you've tracked all of your actions to completion, you're going to do pretty well as part of getting that implementation sorted. I know that there's a lot of kind of things that I'm sharing so far that feel like it's quite a decent amount of paperwork and quite a decent amount of just work, generally speaking, that's required for a health and safety management system. But fundamentally, you might find that in your experience, you don't have to do something as radical as implement everything like this at the same time. You might actually find that the maturity of your business means that you've already got OSTT set up in its own way. So don't worry about revolution. At times, think about evolution rather than revolution. And to simplify that even further, we can actually start to think about pacing using something called the three E's. Now, the three E's aren't kind of like a, a, a specific thing. It is something, technically speaking, that I've kind of worked to before, but it broadly follows similar DuPont principles. And the first D is establish, then it's embed, then it's em evolve. 
So fundamentally, when we're starting things up, we always want to establish it within the business. We know that establishing something, there's going to be a few teething issues. We know that there's going to be a couple of implementation challenges. We might find that relative to those kind of four P's that I set up at the start, we've got issues with performance, people, or potentially even the patterns that we thought people would use. But in reality, they're really struggling with. So fundamentally, when we're looking at health and safety management systems, don't overpromise and underdeliver. Establish, then embed it, then evolve it. Sounds really simple, but it can be very easy to get ahead of ourselves, especially if those external pressures are pushing on us to deliver a digital management system very quickly. I've got a few kind of things to consider as well, just around pacing uh, on the left that you can see there. The first being think global, act local. And again, that can be really useful if you are, for example, a health and safety leader in a much larger, larger organization than necessarily one that's just managing a single site. But fundamentally, it's the scalability of what is global and what is local. If we think about people, fundamentally, they are always going to be at a local level. Our doers are always going to have one demand and one action in one form or another. So fundamentally, don't ever forget them and don't ever forget that actually to deliver on the health and safety management system, you will need doers that are fundamentally going to be acting locally relative to them. So keep that context, keep that perspective in mind while you're designing how people are actually going to work through your safety management system. Um, I've got down there about prioritizing for strategic and tactical success. It is really just, again, taking that kind of perspective check and realizing that not everything can be completed at once but fundamentally setting expectations is critical i've been in businesses before now where they've said the objective is to achieve forty five thousand and one in a year okay i mean that's that's a lofty goal that's a really lofty goal and actually yes they've done a gap analysis as part of that but even something as simple as saying we've done the gap analysis and we've realized that the entire business doesn't track any actions I mean, that can have a massive, massive pushback on how much time you have available to be able to achieve the strategic and tactical ambitions that you've set out. Non-conformances are a massive part of any management system. So fundamentally, when you're planning your strategies, you're planning your tactics, set the expectations in a clear way, but also give yourself some resilience and give yourself some time if you need it. Um, I touched upon this in the, uh, the the kind of the initial post that I put out, but fundamentally, keep in the back of your pocket time, quantity, quality, cost, capacity, and culture. Now, I will make sure that the slide deck as much as possible is shared at the end of this as well. So don't worry about writing all this down very quickly. But fundamentally, when you're working in a safety management system, it's in the context of business. And these six things will always affect productivity and business fundamentally more than anything else in my experience. So time, quantity, quality, cost, capacity, culture are key things to consider when you're working through your safety management system. Defining your barriers and prerequisites is going to be quite a big one as well. So if we take that kind of time, quantity, quality, cost, capacity, culture for a sec and pick out a couple of things, you might actually find that you've got no team. You've got very few doers. And as a result, the capacity to be able to deliver on the expectations of your safety management system is massively diminished, massively diminished. So really understanding what your challenges are, have a blue sky session, get the stakeholders involved that are actually going to be a part of this, that you've set out in that people part at the beginning and write out what the barriers are and think about what prere prerequisites you need to succeed based upon them. So very simply, one that I've used in the past is a three-phase approach. Agree a strategic priority, establish a governance structure, and fundamentally define how you're going to engage with people to deliver on it. So I said to, in a couple of the posts, why wouldn't we go with 45,001? If we're designing a safety management system, why wouldn't we just go for the gold standard straight away? Why wouldn't we go for something that could just really de develop us and deliver strong business outcomes as part of it? Well, there's a couple of questions to ask for yourself. First and foremost, is your governance system ready for a health and safety management system aligned to 45,001? Now, this is an example of a very kind of simple governance structure in some respects. But fundamentally, if you're kind of thinking, OK, well, actually, I don't even have a governance structure. You don't have to do something really kind of significant or really complicated but just writing down the relationship between the different parts of your business to start with and thinking, oh, actually, 
we don't really monitor improvements because we don't monitor actions could be a bit of a deal breaker to getting a safety management system established in the first place. If we think about reactive management and go, right, actually, all of our events, our accidents, our investigations, our incidents, near misses, hazards, all of that are all paper based. And it takes someone three days out of every month to bring together a monthly report. Again, you're going to really struggle from the agility that's needed for a 45,001 system. So outline your governance system to start with, identify where the barriers are as part of it, and then work out the pace that you might need to be able to succeed against it. Define what's going to add the value in your business against that governance system. So fundamentally, if you're looking at inputs, outputs and outcomes, what's going to be the most value adding thing for you? Is it going to be having a really nice swanky management system or actually is it going to be to start with, let's focus on the fundamentals, focus on the technical solutions that we need in the business to the technical problems, keep people safe, keep people healthy and fundamentally make sure that we're closing out actions from accidents or incidents or things that are happening. One thing that you can do to really help this is take your A to Z risk management portfolio or your hazard lists and characterize the criticality of issues in them. Now, you might find that this is part of a technical gap analysis that you've already done already, but even just having something simple like a visualization of the A to Z of all of your topic areas and going actually from this gap analysis, yeah, the issues are a little bit bigger than we thought they might be as part of that it can make a huge change and it can really just help set out the expectations for how you're going to build your management system in the future. One thing that I've helped a few clients with from a Simple Foundry's point of view is giving them a process list. Like if I ask everyone on this call right now, can you actually tell me what, what do you do every day in safety? What do you actually do? But yeah, it's really difficult. It's really like, oh my God, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm just doing my job, Pete. I'm just doing my job. It's safety. I'm just doing it. I get it. I've been there. But it can be really difficult then to justify additional resource needs or justify actually what do we need to change in the business to succeed in a health and safety management system. So having an A to Z process list that you can refer back to and actually even say something as simple as saying, right, actually from accidents, accidents isn't just about filling in an accident investigation form. It's about the notification. It's about the investigation, it's about the RIDOR report, and it's about the return to work form. As a very rough example, naturally, you might have more or less attached to this. But fundamentally, taking an A to Z list approach that you've already kind of linked to as part of your business uh, kind of risk process list can be really useful. I appreciate kind of time is of the essence as part of this. So I'm going to flick through a couple of other bits on a more like generalized basis. But don't forget that complexity can flourish without your guiding hand as a safety professional. No matter if you are working on a single site or if you're working, for example, for a big multinational business, complexity can flourish without your guidance and without your structure. So if we think about something simple like, how do we report an accident? This is an example from a business that I've worked in before, where actually you find that the process from filling in an accident form requires a whole bunch of paper-based admin. And actually taking a step back and thinking we can simplify this by using digitization and automation and kind of Microsoft, well, actually it makes life a lot easier. So fundamentally, complexity can flourish without you. For the benefit of your frontline staff, simplicity should define their experience. And it's their experience rather than the interfaces that they use that makes the difference. If they feel that something is simple and easy to use, they'll use it more. It's just, it's just, you'll know it yourself. It's just easier to use something that's easy. So take Microsoft and leverage it for yourselves. Um, there is a bit of an example as to how, how you can do this uh, that I've, I've kind of got to very quickly share. But again, I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to kind of make this fairly Fairly yeah, show us, show us Pete. Don't worry, we're, we're doing all right in time. Doing all right? Yeah, cool. All right. So in, rather than you guys having to necessarily just go to your screen and scan this with a QR code for a sec, if you jump into the chat, uh, there is a little form that you can fill in. Don't worry about kind of getting this form particularly sort of like detailed or anything like that. But if you want to give it a go for a second, please do feel free. Now, what this particular form does is it takes a hazard incident or near miss process and it digitizes it. So we take the Microsoft form, 
you fill in the information to it. It then takes that information that you filled in, adds it to an Excel list, adds it, adds it to a Microsoft list, adds it to a Microsoft action tracker so that you can plan what actions you've said need doing and make sure they're actually done. And it will automatically store the information that gets sent through in a dedicated Microsoft Teams folder. And you can do that all automatically, all without any extra cost, all without anything that you actually need to purchase beyond what you've already got as your standard Microsoft business account. It's amazing what you can actually achieve through Microsoft on this for free. So give that a go and let us know kind of what you think as we're, we're sort of going through in the chat. Now, what I will say is that that's quite a simple process that I've explained there, but the implementation steps, the tasks that were associated with the accident version that I've done were a little bit kind of complicated at times. Um, I think at this point, it's probably easy to just sort of differentiate between simple, complex and complicated. So if we think about something simple, it's like baking a cake. You follow a recipe and you get a cake right as part of it we can think about something that is complicated which is sending someone to the moon in a rocket right there's a lot of different steps there's a lot of things that need to come together but you can ultimately follow it and then get someone to the moon and then we've got something that's complex which is like raising a kid so i'm not going to i'm not going to get people to put their hands up in the chat and say right raise your hand if you've got a kid but if you've got more than one kid especially i'm sure you'll know that you can't ever raise them the same it's complex. What works for one might not work for the other. Um, I don't have kids yet, but I do have a small spaniel. And I'll tell you what, a load of information on Facebook, YouTube, the internet said, please do, you know, do it this way. You'll get a great dog at the end of it. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. It was a really complex experience trying to raise a dog during COVID because the rule book was thrown out. So fundamentally, don't underestimate complicated change when it comes down to implementing uh, your safety management system bits and pieces. So over the course of a year, there was quite a lot that I actually implemented, iterated with and adapted to implement an accident approach. Sorry, a, a, an accident digital, oh, geez, apologies, a digital accident process when something happened at a site. And you can see there's a lot of different steps that I took to get to a point where we've not only implemented that process, but we've also validated it and made sure that it works. Um, Lucia, I can see that you've asked a quick question there. Where's that Microsoft feature available? Is it included within any, any license? If you've got a Microsoft business account, you will have access to Microsoft Forms, Microsoft Power Automate, and kind of the suite of what's called Microsoft 365 that that's included in. Um, you can actually just go on, literally, I think it's like, uh, office.microsoft.com and have a look at all the different apps that you've got access to there. Um, I'll come to a couple of other questions on the end as well. Thank you. Uh, without going into, again, a huge amount of detail because of timing, we want to get through a few questions, uh, but fundamentally the sky's the limit with what you can use Microsoft for in a health and safety management system. Literally take that A to Z list approach. I've gone through a bunch of different processes with a few clients now, and we've identified in one business 90 different processes that can have some form of automation in their business. It, it's, it's huge. It's a, an, an amazing opportunity to really streamline and simplify what you're doing, reduce the admin burden, take the cost out of it. And you don't have to spend five or six figures on a multi-year contract with a third party software supplier because you can do so much of it in Microsoft at the same time as building up things like digital literacy within your teams. So um, Lucia, just to answer a couple of bits as well with the Microsoft features, these are just a few that you can kind of have access to to start with. Copilot, which is something that you can see at the bottom here, is a little bit different. So Copilot is Microsoft's kind of like AI um, assistant, if you will. There is a bit of an extra cost associated with that, but you can have a free trial to see how you might be able to use it within your business. So fundamentally, have a look, get out there, start to engage with these different bits in Microsoft because there's a huge, a huge amount of benefit attached to it. Um, as I say, from my point of view, she advisor to she manager, group health and safety manager, head of safety to now health and safety consultant. There's a load of different bits and pieces that I've used in Microsoft. It, I, I could wax lyrical about it, but fundamentally, if you've got a challenge, drop me a message, let me know. I'd love to help you out with it. 
Um, I can see there's a question that had come in a little earlier on uh, there from Danish uh, about, can you tell me about evaluating health and safety management system options? Uh, kind of. What, what I'm going to say for a second is if you fill in the feedback survey for what I'm about to go through next, I'll send you across that health and safety software supply requirement cheat sheet that covers a load of different questions for what you might want to look at from a health and safety management system uh, supplier, if you will, from a third party solution all the way through to just generally speaking, third party solutions in health and safety. So if you're really interested in that, fill in the evaluation form I'm about to put in next and we'll go through it. Um, but at that point, thank you very much for listening. There was a whole load of information in there and I hope that it's been useful for, for you. Happy to open up uh, to any questions, Christian. That's great, Pete. Thanks very much for that. And uh, yeah, lots and lots of um, valuable information there. So so thanks very much. Uh, I'm just scanning through the chat, but if anybody wants to unmute on the Zoom and ask a question, um, just go to reactions and raise your hand and then uh, I'll call you up to, uh, to ask a question. Uh, John was asking um, that uh, quite a few businesses are moving towards Google platforms. Are, can you sort of map this Microsoft functionality across over to, to Google? Uh, the short answer is yes, um, and it depends on how you want to do it. So Google have got their own ecosystem, right? So if we imagine Microsoft 365 has got Excel, Words, PowerPoint, Google has got uh, Google Sheets, Google Docs, and uh, Google Slides, right, as part of this. They also have Google Forms behind it. Now, you can keep kind of the Google ecosystem together and interlink a few of these bits and pieces together, or you can actually use Google connectors with Microsoft. So if you've got kind of like a hybridization where you're moving to Google or you're kind of doing both things with Microsoft and with Google, you can actually link both of these ecosystems together using the connectors in Microsoft Power Automate. Um, I'll see if I can quickly find a, a, a link to that connector just while we're having a chat, Christian. Is that a bit like a sort of webhook that you can that you use to link different apps together? So if we imagine, um, like, for example, I have my user account for Microsoft that's linked to me. It's peter at simplefoundry.co.uk. That's linked specifically to me. Uh, so my connector is to peter at simplefoundry.co.uk's Microsoft Excel to my uh, Outlook, to my uh, Power Automate type of bit and piece there. So it, it's kind of like the connectors are linked to your account, but then to the program that you want to link it to. And hence it kind of connects you to the account to automate it together. It's kind of like giving it authorization to work on your behalf. And you can yeah. do that with both your Microsoft account and your Google information um, as a hybridization, or you can just specifically do it within Google, but I haven't touched touched on that in this session yeah very good um what sort of stage of organization would you say this is most applicable to you know is it something that mm. um a smaller organization you know where everything's paper-based and they want to just start that digitization process you know it sounds perfect for them what if you're kind of more established and you've already got for example um yeah. Uh, another safety management digital safety management system in place you know is that sort yeah. of are you a bit beyond this or is it still applicable yeah. for, for you um so it, it the short answer is it depends which is really really wishy-washy for a second so i'll give you two quick examples um in the book that i mentioned about the first 90 days it gives kind of business maturity in a different way than what we see in the bradley curve for health and safety and it talks about businesses being in startup turnaround accelerated growth realignment or sustaining success now, at any point on that level of business maturity, you can use bits and pieces in Microsoft. Hmm. If, for example, you are a business that is quite small, let's say that you're only five people, right? So I'm working with a couple of those businesses in my standard health and safety consultancy day job, but we're still using Microsoft. We're still basically building their A to Z management system in Microsoft Teams. We're then giving them kind of like accident reporting sort of functionality and health and safety event reporting functionality baked into Microsoft Teams so that not only they can use it, but their subcontractors and contractors have easily got access to it as well. So fundamentally, it really doesn't matter what kind of size you are. There's going to be bits and pieces you can use it to uh, use it for. Sorry. The key is almost mapping out your processes against your A to Z topics that you engage with from a technical point of view and then integrating it across. 
if you are using something like safety culture, for example, which I see has kind of been mentioned here at the moment, the best thing about Microsoft it costs you nothing to try. Like literally you've already got access to it. The only thing it's going to cost you to start with is time. So fundamentally, if you are thinking, I want to make a change, I want to move away from like Evotics, safety culture, I want to move away from uh, Azure, she software, whatever it's going to be, you can you can literally trial it for free with Microsoft. You can build it yourself without having to purchase anything else. So to be honest with you, Christian, if people are thinking about it, I'd say go for it. What have you got to lose? Give it a go. Yeah, I was going to ask that question, and uh, but I was going to I wasn't going to mention the name of the company. I thought I didn't want to. I, oh, do that was down. maybe but a little you, bit less tactful you, than me. But in no, that respect, you, it's responding you, 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 to a question yeah, in the chat exactly. that specifically no, mentioned them. <laughs> exactly, and you you mentioned a few other suppliers, so uh, that was fine. Um, but but that gives a good opportunity to actually uh, talk a little bit more about what you and Simple Foundry or how you and Simple Foundry can help. So if somebody is in yeah. that situation and they'd love to, you know know more about building their own systems or if they're starting out and would, would love to have a bit of help rather than going down the route of trial and error which i know you say it's it's free and it's only your time but obviously time is yeah. a very valuable commodity could you just talk us through a little bit how uh how you could help what the sort of different uh products or or, or packages or however that works are and, and yeah you know. yeah absolutely so um at the moment i'm oh, apologies i'm i'm building a, a kind of like a dedicated uh, learn e-learning type of thing so all the information that i've been talking through is going to be in an e-learning package but until that's ready it's basically drop me a message and we'll spend some time together so for example i've worked with a couple of clients recently where we've built their a to z process list and we've just identified we've scoped out the opportunities for improvement and at the same time on that same day we've just literally implemented a few different quick fire bits and pieces which for example in this case have been the health and safety event systems and the accident reporting systems so to start with it's really simple drop me a message we'll work together through the a to z process list identify what's critical what's really urgent for yourselves and then literally just start digitizing and automating together it's um i'm not going to say it's uncomplicated but fundamentally it doesn't have to be complex we can't we just can keep it really simple as part of yeah. that yeah. and watch this space for e-learning in the future good stuff a uh, question about um is this applicable to different sectors so construction oil and gas etc uh, yeah yes, absolutely yeah absolutely so um at the moment for example i'm working with uh who am i working with telecoms food manufacturing um media the uh, education from like secondary schools big sort of campuses type of things with uh what's it called um oh my brain's going apologies i haven't had my my uh lunchtime sandwich just yet <laughs> um academy groups that's it and yes, uh, kind of trust groups as part of it so fundamentally when we look at uh, process compliance for different sectors yeah are absolutely applicable because at the end of the day we're just looking at people and upgrading paperwork and fundamentally if you uh, have access to microsoft have paperwork you want to improve unfortunately i don't speak any other languages so it's speak english drop me a message <laughs> we'll, we'll work it out it's literally applicable to anything and everyone from that point of view good stuff good stuff um You've also been invited onto a podcast as well. So, uh, so I've seen from Peter. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. I'll be in touch, Peter. That'd be great. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Peter's, uh, I think he's just left actually. This meeting's yet to go off, but he's he's going to come and do a session on the uh, on the safety roundtable uh, sometime soon as well. So, uh, yeah, he's, look yeah forward terrific. To, look forward to that. Well, look, uh, that's Brilliant. been really, really um, interesting. Um, I have come away with um, lots to think about, I think, and I'm sure everybody's the same, you know, it's opened up my eyes to uh, a fantastic array of different opportunities uh, that I, to be honest, didn't know uh, existed. So really, really appreciate that. Thanks for, for coming on and, and oh, taking your questions. Um, really encourage everybody to um, connect with, with Peter, if you're not already on, on LinkedIn, um, drop him a line, fill in his survey and uh, share some feedback, you know, share on, on LinkedIn or, drop me an email as well and just keep me up to date with how you're getting on because i'd be really fascinated yeah. to see how people could start implementing this stuff perfect and, and likewise as well i've got my kind of contact information just down here as well but i've put my linkedin in the uh, in the chat feel free to reach out if i can help you in any way from that point of view but thank you so much for your questions everyone if there's questions that you didn't get a chance to kind of get answered drop me a message i'd be more than happy to work through that with you as well
Good stuff. Well, thanks everyone for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you again on uh, another Safety Roundtable soon. Cheers. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the Safety and Risk Success podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. Does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.